I, in trying to recommend books, there are a great many titles available, and I've just selected a, a few of them. And I'd like to begin with one of the classics of the 19th century, a short uh, pamphlet by the great French economist Frédéric Bastiat, probably the greatest economic journalist of all time and also an original uh, theorist. He was one uh, economist whom Karl Marx particularly despised, so at least that's one point in his favor. Uh, the work is The Law. Many of you will have read this already. It made a big impression on me when I first read it uh, so long ago as 1962. Uh, what a uh, theme in the law is that I think is of fundamental importance is that Bastiat says that uh, the state or the government can't get new powers or rights that individuals don't have. So, for example, since individuals don't have the right to take uh, property to redistribute it to poor people. Say if I said that, uh, oh, there's someone I think is very deserving of getting a lot more money, so I'm going to take some money from a rich person and give it to that person. I wouldn't have the right to do it. I wouldn't have the right to steal the rich person's uh, property. So Bastiat says, similarly, the state doesn't have the right to do that. The state can't get any new rights that individuals don't have. And he criticizes on this basis uh, many of the programs of various political parties in France at the time. He was writing, for example, uh, they, there were programs uh, by the uh, French socialist Louis Blanc to have a system of workers, uh, workshops would be making jobs available to poor people. And he criticizes that for violating this principle that the state can't acquire new rights. Uh, another basic theme in that book, which I think is of great importance, and it prefigures an argument that Friedrich Hayek made in his book of 1944, The Road to Serfdom, was that Bastiat says that uh, socialists and other planners uh, view themselves as above society, that they are the ones who are educating people or compelling people to behave in a certain fashion. The people are unenlightened and need to be controlled by experts. That the, There's an elite group of educated or uh, people who are, really know the truth, and it's their job to teach the rest of us how to behave. Uh, this is a theme that's very pop, goes back. You find it in Plato's Republic, and that it, we find it even today. I wrote a column recently on Cass Sunstein, who's a very prominent uh, uh, legal academic who has similar views. So Bastiat has a very penetrating criticism of this idea. Now, the second book I think is very important. Again, a very short book. I'm starting off with the easier works, and then we'll get into the somewhat longer and perhaps more difficult ones. Later is a pamphlet by Murray Rothbard called uh, What Has Government Done to Our Money? Uh, this was originally published by the Freedom School, uh, Robert Lefebvre. I again remember when that one first came out. Uh, and what Rothbard argues in that book, it's point essential to grasping a proper monetary system, is that money 
is a commodity. Uh, today, we often think of mo fiat money. Money is just a creation of the government. A popular view holds that money is whatever is accepted as money. So money is, is, uh, doesn't have any real basis. Just whatever people take to be money is money. But Rothbard, following Ludwig von Mises' famous uh, money regression theorem that no money must originate as a commodity, and he on that basis uh, favors a strict gold standard. And in defending that strict gold standard, he very much opposes fractional reserve banking, seeing this as the key to the to the. Uh, business cycle. It's through expansion of the money supply by, by bank credit, by bankers, because of the fractional reserve system, that creates an artificial boom leading to depression. So although this is a very short pamphlet, if you read this, I think you'll get a fundamental grasp of monetary theory. And this will enable you to progress further. Uh, extending from monetary theory uh, more widely into uh, other parts of economics, I recommend another popular work, relatively short, although longer than the first two, and this is Henry Hazlitt's book, uh, uh, 1946, Economics in One Lesson. Uh, it's not, please note, it's not one easy lesson. It's just <laughs> one lesson. It's uh, for many of the people in government, and various uh, Keynesian economists, it's not a lesson, a very easy lesson at all. I should say, uh, just if you'll permit me a digression, one story on uh, Keynesian economics. Uh, when Ludwig von Mises was teaching at uh, New York University, uh, for a while, in addition to his famous seminar, he gave another course, which was an introductory course in economics. And he used Hazlitt's Economics in One Lesson as a textbook. So on one occasion, uh, Mises uh, said... Uh, mentioned something, and he said, no economist would ever say this. And a student was unwise enough to put up his hand and said, Professor, that Professor Mises, so-and-so uh, uh, said in this textbook says exactly that. And Mises replied, uh, he is not an economist, he is a Keynesian. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, to return to economics in one lesson, uh, the lesson that Hazlitt has in mind, which is one that's so hard to grasp, is in addition to cons considering the immediate consequences of a particular policy measure, uh, we also need to consider the long-run consequences or, and also what would happen if we didn't have this policy, what would have taken? It's a counterfactual uh, proposition. Say, supposing uh, we have minimum wage laws, what would, ha would have happened if we didn't have the minimum wage laws? And Hazlitt shows for all sorts of interventionist measures that the measures will have disastrous long-run consequences. They won't work at all. Uh, for example, uh, to take a topic that's quite relevant today, uh, many people say we need protective tariffs because otherwise people will lose jobs because they'll be uh, foreign industries will out-compete them and then the American workers will lose their jobs. So isn't this terrible that workers will be out of work?
But what Hazlitt points out is that if, as a result of lower prices, people buy more products, this will create jobs for other workers. So it's not the case that tariffs really promote employment of American workers overall if we consider the full effects of of the measure. Uh, another uh, fallacy he, may, he exposes is one that uh, workers need to have wages high enough so they can buy back the product if the argument uh, by the interventions in favor of this is say, well, if workers can't afford to buy the product, then uh, the people selling it just won't make any money. They, they'll go out of business. But as Hazlitt points out, there's no reason to think that the workers in, say, who were producing automobiles are the ones who are going to be purchasing those very automobiles. They're, they whether the wages you uh, worker gets determined by the uh, marginal their marginal productivity and whether it, it doesn't follow that workers who make more expensive products that sell for higher prices would have to uh, get higher wages in order to have enough money to buy the product it, it's if the, pro the whether the product will be successful will be dependent on whether it sells on the market, not just to the workers of, who are producing it. Now, the three books I've given you so far are quite easy. Perhaps Hazlitt's is a bit more difficult than the first two. So now we can get into the the really the harder stuff. And one. I think I want to mention one by Ludwig von Mises, a uh, great book of 1922, Socialism. Uh, this developed uh, one argument there, the famous calculation argument based on his article of 1920, but developed much uh, more detail, is that a, so uh, a socialist economy is really impossible if you take a socialist economy to mean something like a, a economy on a large scale, say the scale of a modern nation with uh, changing consumer demands, because the argument was that uh, if you have a certain list of consumer goods to be produced, then if you take the production goods, there are various combinations of these production goods that will produce the consumer's goods. So you need some means of saying how, determining how efficient, what is the most efficient combination of factors, production, to produce these consumer goods. And to do that, you have to have a system of market prices. In, Mises said, without market prices, we can't have any economy at all. And one thing, uh, in addition to the calculation argument, sometimes people think of socialism as the book socialism. They think only of the calculation argument. But there's a great deal else in the book. Uh, for example, Mises gives a very strong defense of the traditional or bourgeois family. Uh, he wouldn't, uh, had he lived today, it's safe to say that he wouldn't view with much favor the modern feminist movement or other movements that uh, designed to overthrow the traditional family. And he's very much in favor of that and argues in, uh, in defense of that. Now, I'd like now to turn to, uh, that's a fairly long book. I'd like now to turn to an even longer book, which is Murray Rothbard's Man, Economy, and State. Uh, we had uh, this past June in the uh, Rothbard Graduate Seminar 
uh, we covered the book, and I reread the book. I read it over the years. I, again, this is one. I remember that one when it came out, also in 1962. As you know, I'm quite old, so I, I was around when some of these books originally came out. So when I reread the book, I was impressed by the enormous intellectual scope of the book that Rothbard shows how he builds up the entire structure production showing how income is imputed to the original factors of land and labor and how the structure of capital is built up through the various stages of production. And in the book, he, there's a, a, an enormous number of arguments on particular topics. So every page is filled with interesting arguments. Uh, in that respect, in having a large number of arguments that uh, just coming at you one after another, he resembles very much a philosopher, uh, Robert Nozick, whom he didn't get along with so well, but they had a very similar intellectual style, in my opinion, of, of just having very uh, series of argument. And one point's very important in reading Rothbard. He, he moved very fast in his process of thought, so he expects readers to be able to really fill in the steps of his argument that one uh, sometimes you might think that you wonder, well, how did he get to this? So you have to reconstruct it in order to understand what he's saying. And in the book, I it comes along with it in the in the edition published, recent edition published by the Mises Institute, includes his power and market. And this gives a very detailed and systematic analysis of all forms of government intervention in the economy. And this, I would, I think, if you want to get into economic theory in a detailed level, this is one of the two books I think you have to read. Now, the other one, of course, is the great work of Ludwig von Mises' Human Action, which came out in 1949. And what Mises does here, it's his, really his, he gives a very detailed account of the basis in the theory of knowledge for economics. Uh, he also had an earlier book, a collection of essays, Epistemological Problems of Economics. And what he tries to do, and does, carries this off with his enormous knowledge of the philosophical literature, he tries to, he shows how economics can, is, can be developed as a science of human action from thinking about the concept of action and drawing out the consequences of that concept. He develops the whole systematic structure of economics on that basis. And the last book I want to mention is the great two-volume work of uh, Murray Rothbard, uh, An Austrian Perspective on the History of Economic Thought. And this is much more than a history of economics. It's a comprehensive picture of the European civilization during the period Rothbard was writing about. And uh, I'll have time just for one topic in the book in the second volume, which I think is of particular interest, is uh, Murray Rothbard's analysis of Marxism. And here he follows the uh, political philosopher uh, Eric Vogelin, who had been a member of Mises' private seminar, that uh, Marxism is a kind of what he calls a Gnostic 
movement. The Gnostics were a group of uh, early Christian uh, Christian heretics. And there was also a non-Christian Gnosticism who thought that the world was a kind of a dark place and only some kind of secret knowledge uh, possessed by experts could save us. So Rothbard views Marxism in this perspective and uh, shows how there are various parallels between uh, Gnostic and millenarian movements and modern Marxism. He's here following the uh, books of Vogel in uh, Political Religions, and came out in 1938, and Vogel's book, The New Science of Politics, in 1952. So he's very much influenced that by Vogel. Uh, one story on this, I think he had became more influenced by Vogel than he had been at an earlier period. I remember he once asked me uh, on Vogel, he said, do you think this like leap in being means anything. That was a key concept of, of Eric Vogelin. So he was a bit skeptical about some of Vogelin's more general philosophy, but he applied and developed his ideas in analyzing Marxism. So I think those are a few of the books I think would help you in, in understanding the crisis we face today. And as you will see, you see if you read them, none of them have anything to say about the opioid crisis. <laughs>